Um, my name is Rick Marcus, and I get to moderate this excellent panel. I'll resist the urge to claim that our panel is better than the first panel. I'll let it prove that itself. Um, I guess I find this panel to be addressed to what seemed to me the more interesting, challenging, and important issues, uh, partly because they are related to things that I got really interested in a long time ago. Um, our panel is dealing with something called choice of law, which got mentioned a bit during the first panel. And just to introduce that briefly for those who don't know that much about it, I'll ask all the people in the room who fully understand choice of law, please, to put up their hands. OK. So we're all on a sort of an even playing keel here. Um, for those of you who haven't really ever heard of it, uh, there is a set of legal rules that deal with determining what jurisdiction's law should be decided to, dis should be applied to decide who wins the lawsuit. Um, and normally the easy reflex notion is, well, ours. We're in California, therefore California. Um, law professors have spent gobs of time working on whether that answer is always right. And when they spend a lot of time working on things, as you may have noticed, even if you're in your first year in law school, those things get complicated and sometimes seem hard to decipher. So that's the background for today's discussion. The foreground for today's discussion is transfer, because if you take that murky background and then layer transfer on top of it, and we take a case from place number one and move it to place number two, and we have one set of murky choice of law rules in place number one and a different set of murky choice of law rules in place number two, uh, you can imagine that the pleasure law professors get in thinking about such things increases geometrically. Um, more than 30 years ago, I got real interested in this kind of subject, <laughs> transfer and choice of law, but in a much simpler setting. And that is, if the case in one part of the federal judicial system is sent to a different part of the federal judicial system, do different attitudes towards federal law affect how the court that got the case decides it. And my conclusion was that shouldn't matter. Uh, even though, as you've heard, there's this old Supreme Court case called Van Dusen versus Barrick that says where it's state law, uh, the choice of law rule of the state that started the case goes with it. I, should, I said, well, the federal judge who gets a case should decide it correctly. I felt great about three or four years later when then Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg cited and even quoted this in an opinion. Uh, but then, as happens with law professors, a few years after that, some law professor showed that I was wrong and, and, and foolish. Um, and so I've been really interested in this for a long time. That's what is, in many ways, the focus from different perspectives of our outstanding four panelists now, I'm going to make one seditious observation about where this focus really matters, because at least one of our panelists has spent a lot of time talking about that also. Um, there aren't that many 1404A transfers. But something I got about a week ago shows that of all pending civil cases, in the US federal judicial system, unless if you exclude prisoner cases and social security appeals, according to these figures, more than 40% of the cases are transferred cases, but they're transferred not under 1404A, but under multi-district proceedings. So that's the big one that relates to the smaller one that we'll be talking about. And so I'm just delighted to be able not to have to express an opinion, 
but only to introduce the four wonderful speakers that we have here to address the choice of law kinds of issues that exist. And I'll introduce them in the order in which you'll be seeing them, and then you'll be seeing them. Uh, I have told them each they have about 15 minutes. That should leave us with time to speak further among ourselves and with you. Um, and so I'll also try to introduce what I understand in general is what they'll be talking about. And first, and I believe they will be speaking in the order that you see them uh, in front of you. And first will be Andrew Bratt, who is uh, now in his third year? Third year of teaching at Bolt across the bay. Uh, I gather they've officially changed what the school is called. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's new to the game um, from my perspective, which I cleared with at least some of my co-panelists. There are basically two generations before you. And you can guess which of us is in which generation probably by looking at us. He's in the younger generation, but he's already made a name for himself that's quite prominent and particularly in a, in a very interesting piece in the Notre Dame Law Review where I got to have a contribution also. He addressed the problem of choice of law in MDL proceedings, so he knows about the big one. We're gonna speak about the less frequent problem today and, and he's gonna be uh, reflecting on what Atlantic Marine portends about some choice of law issues there, and also reflecting on the extent to which the court is showing that it's moving away from uh, giving latitude to plaintiffs' uh, forum choice as dominant on matters of importance. Second uh, will be Kevin Claremont, who is the Ziff professor of, at Cornell, um, and I'll ask you to think which generation he falls in. Uh, he is a prolific, prolific, prolific author on a very wide range of topics. One of the ones that really caught my eye a long time ago was a very interesting piece he wrote on uh, the magic significance in civil procedure of the number three, uh, which I recommend to you. He is, the, he is the author of one of the leading case books and has broad experience not only with uh, library learning but use of pretty sophisticated empirical methods for answering legal questions. Um, he's going to talk about a basic question that's a choice of law question of sorts, and that is, what law do you use to decide whether a forum selection clause is valid? Uh, I think you heard some, something about that during the first panel. The third speaker will be Adam Steinman, um, whom Mary Kay and I are delighted for a variety of reasons, not just generational ones, uh, to have had join us as co-authors on the Federal Practice and Procedure Treatise on which we both work. Uh, he's now at the University of Alabama. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's gotten quite a profile in a variety of subjects, including uh, pleading, um, and uh, he will be addressing uh, he will be delving further into what's called the Erie issues here, which you may or may not have encountered thus far in your law school experience, uh, which is a different kind of choice of law problem. Can federal courts do things differently from the way the courts in the state in which they sit handle those problems? And then finally, Linda Mullenix, who holds the Morris and Rita Atlas Chair in Advocacy at the University of Texas, and uh, may even be more prolific than Kevin, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of National Law Journal pieces on top of dozens and dozens and dozens of articles have appeared. I can tell you have another conference across the street uh, and my colleague Morris Ratner was speaking there and displayed on the screen was a quotation from one of Linda's articles that bears on the, sop the topic across the street. Linda uh, is also going to be uh, addressing the source of legal rules to determine validity of forum selection clauses, um, and I think also discussing whether the Supreme Court is losing patience or losing patience even more with what you might call procedural gamesmanship by litigants or maybe by litigants who are plaintiffs. Uh, and so I think there's much more to be learned and I look forward to learning it, and I turn it over to Andrew. 
thank you, uh, Rick, and thank you uh, also to the uh, the organizers of this conference, uh, especially uh, Steve and Scott. You know, this is not one of the cases that uh, likely appeared in the you know New York Times review of you know most. Uh, prominent cases the Supreme Court decided last year, and it was fact unanimous, but I think uh, what this um, panel demonstrates, as I tell my first year students every year, is that this is uh, really where the rubber meets the road for the vast majority of people trying uh, to uh, enforce their rights. So I, I appreciate their vision uh, in having such a conference. Uh, thanks also, Rick, for calling me young. Uh, I needed that now that my, uh, my first year CivPro students are 15 years younger than I am. Uh, so I guess that's just the circle of life. Eventually, uh, you become old. But uh, in any event, I appreciate it. So my paper focuses on the very uh, sort of last sliver of Atlantic Marine, which you've heard talked about a little bit already, uh, that involves the choice of law implications of a transfer uh, pursuant to a forum selection clause under 1404A. So what did Atlantic Marine do? Uh, it laid out a straightforward rule. It says if you have a transfer pursuant to a forum selection clause, a valid forum selection clause, then the transferee court should apply its choice of law rules. So in Atlantic Marine itself, after the case is transferred from the district court in Texas to the district court in Virginia, the Virginia District Court should apply the choice of law rules of the state of Virginia. Now, in so doing, uh, the court explicitly departed from the standard rule in transfer cases, which is from that case that Rick mentioned, 1964's Van Dusen versus Barrick, uh, that held that when a case is transferred under 1404A, it carries with it, like in a suitcase, the choice of law rules of the transferor court. In that case, the court called transfer a mere housekeeping measure resulting in a change of courtrooms, but not a change in the law. In Atlantic Marine, for the first time, the court held that a 1404A transfer was both a change in courtrooms and a change in the law. Now, the rule has several virtuous things about it. First, uh, it's clear and it's easy to apply. Uh, sometimes, at least, uh, not, maybe Steve raised some good questions about marginal cases, but at least in the mine run of cases, sometimes it's good just to have an answer to a question. Uh, and the court was clear about what the answer was. When you have a transfer pursuant to a forum selection clause, Van Dusen doesn't apply. Uh, second, the rule makes good sense given the rest of what the court says. I mean, the court is clearly enthusiastic about forum selection clauses, and to allow a plaintiff to circumvent a forum selection clause and obtain a choice of law that's different from what it would have been had uh, they followed the forum selection clause, the defendant would only get a half a loaf from the transfer. That is, it would get the transfer to the forum it wanted, but potentially not the law that would apply if the case had been filed there in the first place. Uh, so in essence, what the court has done is to ensure that a forum selection clause is also a choice of law rule selection clause. That is, the forum selection clause becomes a choice of law clause one step removed. Now, uh, although the court's new rule makes good sense in light of its views about forum selection clauses, it does represent a significant change in its thinking about how choice of law rules work in diversity cases, particularly under the transfer statute. Uh, moreover, as, uh, as uh, uh, Steve said in the first uh, panel, the court made this decision with no briefing, uh, almost no discussion at oral argument, uh, no contention from any of the parties that this rule should apply. So when this uh, opinion came across the transom, I was among uh, the Civ Pro professors like Rodman, who was reading along and saying, oh, well, this is interesting, this is interesting. And you get to the last part where they just sort of flippantly change the rules and say, what happened here? Uh, I didn't know that this was in the offing. And in fact, uh, I don't think anybody else did either. Um, so in my limited time, I just want to suggest that the court's choice of law rule in Atlantic Marine uh, represents a pretty significant shift in the court's treatment of choice of law rules in diversity cases. Uh, and I also want to suggest that the court's new approach is of a piece with what it's been doing in personal jurisdiction cases. Uh, and that by being more restrictive in policing uh, the choice of forum uh, of the plaintiffs, they're able to be one, the court is able to police the choice of law implications of forum shopping without actually looking at the content of state's choice of law rules. That is, it's able to police the way that plaintiffs try to game the system 
system without actually passing judgment uh, on what the states do in choice of law because, as Rick suggested, that is extremely complicated and not a business the court wants to get into. I teach choice of law, and I was not among the people uh, to raise his hand uh, when Rick asked who actually understands it. Uh, in fact, somebody once said to me about choice of law, you only get it when you realize that it's incomprehensible. All right, so with respect to choice of law in diversity cases, uh, the guiding star is the court's unanimous decision in Claxon, which came right on the heels of Erie. Now in Claxon, the court handed down also a clear rule. It said that federal courts sitting in diversity have to apply the choice of law rules of the state in which they sit. Uh, and there were two justifications for that rule in Justice Reed's unanimous opinion, or opinion for a unanimous court. One was that the, the rule had, was there to preserve uniformity within a state. That is, if you had choice of law rules that were different between a federal court and a state court sitting across the street from one another, uh, then the Erie Doctrine wouldn't mean a whole heck of a lot because you could have the kind of forum shopping between federal and state courts that Erie was trying to prevent. Moreover, Claxon rested on the justification that choice of law rules were substantive law of the states and not to be altered by uh, the federal courts. Now, Van Dusen, the case that you've been hearing about so far, came about two decades later, and it held that a transfer under 1404A should not result in a change of choice of law rules. And Van Dusen rested on similar principles, both that the accident of diversity should not lead to different results in the federal system that could not be achieved in a state, state court where transfer was not a possibility. And Van Dusen also rested in part on the fact that the Congress, in passing 1404A, had said nothing about uh, the implications for choice of law. Now, the court stuck with this interpretation of 1404A as a housekeeping measure, that is, one that changes courtrooms and doesn't change law, in two later cases. One which you've heard something about, Stewart versus Rico, uh, which held that the transfer statute was procedural uh, for Erie purposes. And in that case, Justice Marshall, in the opinion for the court, uh, in part based his characterization of the transfer statute as procedural on the ground that transfer didn't result in a change of substantive law. Uh, the court stuck with this uh, interpretation of 1404A sometime after that in a case called Ferens versus John Deere. And the court stuck with it even in the face of egregious gamesmanship by the plaintiff. In Ferens, uh, the plaintiffs who were injured in Pennsylvania by a John Deere tractor filed their case in Mississippi, where at least at the time there was personal jurisdiction uh, over John Deere, in order to take advantage of Mississippi's sta longer statute of limitations. Then having filed the case in Mississippi, having taken advantage of that statute of limitations, the plaintiffs moved to transfer the case back home to Pennsylvania in order to have their choice of law cake and their choice of venue, or eat their choice of venue too. And in Ferens, uh, Justice Kennedy noted the court's refusal uh, to base its decision of whether to apply the Van Dusen rule based on its assessment of the plaintiff's conduct. It said again, look, 1404A is a housekeeping measure. It doesn't say anything about substantive law. And we're not going to get into the business of deciding whether it applies or not based on what we think of the litigant's conduct. It's a clear rule, and it's one that's easy to apply. Now, the court's love of forum selection clauses in Atlantic Marine required it to back away from all of this. Um, because the court recognized that the Van Dusen rule would cut against the benefit of enforcing the forum selection clause, and because the court decided to use 1404A rather than one of the other available uh, options to enforce the forum selection clause, uh, it was sort of backed into a corner, as uh, Professor Efron said. Uh, an exception to the Van Dusen rule became a necessity. But it does mark uh, a fairly significant uh, change from what the court had said about transfer and choice of law before. First, the rule in Atlantic Marine provides Supreme Court endorsement of the notion that intrastate disuniformity is acceptable to vindicate the federal policy in favor of forum selection clauses. A party who can obtain a transfer in federal court can get a change of law it wouldn't be able to achieve in the court of a state that would be hostile to enforcing that clause. Now, a lot of that gets into the problem that the court left open as to whether the forum selection clause was valid uh, or invalid. But as I, I think Professor Claremont will say, uh, the federal courts had essentially uh, been following a fairly permissive rule with respect uh, to forum selection clauses for a while. And the Supreme Court's imprimatur uh, is interesting. It wouldn't necessarily have to be this way. As a court had done before uh, in the Southern District of New York, uh, before Atlantic Marine, it's possible to decouple 
the question of what law applies with the question of where the case is transferred to, that is. It would have been possible to enforce the forum selection clause in the federal court and have a transfer under 1404A, but not enforce a change in choice of law if the state in which the case was filed would not have enforced the forum selection clause. Uh, but that approach didn't get a lot of traction, and in any event, the Supreme Court uh, doesn't seem interested in splitting the baby that way. Second big change, uh, the rule in Atlantic Marine demonstrates a willingness to patch judgment on the plaintiff's litigation conduct. So while in Ferens, the court, or at least the majority, was explicit in saying, hey, look, we don't want to get into uh, figuring out whether or not the rule applies based on what we think of the way the litigants have acted, uh, Atlantic Marine was pretty, came down pretty hard on the plaintiffs here for filing in Texas. They talked about them flouting uh, the forum selection agreement, and uh, Justice Alito was pretty, pretty scolding uh, with respect to uh, the results of that, those uh, shenanigans. Uh, finally, uh, the rule in Atlantic Marine represents new thinking about the transfer statute. For the first time, 1404A does require a change in law, not a change in courtrooms, and by affirming the transfer based on 1404A and not the improper venue uh, transfer provision, the court was sort of locked into rethinking the role of the statute. Uh, but as others have mentioned, I think that raises fairly significant questions, uh, or eerie questions, uh, related to whether or not this statute really is procedural and really is a mere housekeeping measure. Uh, the last point I want to make uh, is that uh, the Atlantic Marine case is uh, of a piece with the Supreme Court's recent personal jurisdiction decisions that I, I think uh, folks would agree clamp down uh, on plaintiff's choices of forum. And uh, Professor Arthur Von Maron and Professor Donald Troutman in a very famous article in the 1960s uh, predicted uh, that one way the Supreme Court uh, would be able to get a hold of the choice of law problem and the diversity of choice of law rules in the states would be to use more restrictive personal jurisdiction doctrine to clamp down on plaintiff's choices. That eliminates the ability for plaintiffs to take advantage of different states having different choice of law rules, and it relieves the Supreme Court of the difficult task of getting into evaluating whether a different states' choice of law rules are constitutional under the full faith and credit clause and the due process clause. In fact, the Supreme Court has made very clear uh, since the 1930s that it would prefer to avoid that task uh, if possible. So here in Atlantic Marine, the court goes even further than the personal jurisdiction cases by saying that the plaintiff's filing in an otherwise proper forum uh, eliminates their ability to take advantage of that forum's choice of law rules, something presumably the plaintiff's wanted to take advantage of while filing there, uh, and then uh, by enforcing the forum selection clause with the Van Dusen exception, now the plaintiff's can't engage in that kind of gamesmanship anymore. So Atlantic Marine represents a fairly significant rethinking of the way choice of law rules work in diversity cases in the federal court, and I think uh, that may, it'll be interesting to see whether that marks a trend uh, in other cases where choice of law comes up or uh, whether or not uh, Atlantic Marine stays uh, confined to its small area. My suggestion, uh, or my prediction is that the former is true uh, and not the latter. And at that point, I'll hand it over to Kevin. Okay, let me just begin by uh, contesting something that Rick said there about the utter unimportance of what we're talking about. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of 1404 case, uh, transfers each year um, before Atlantic Marine, and they have a phenomenal impact on outcome. Earlier empirical work I did um, with Ted Eisenberg uh, indicated that in diversity cases, the plaintiff's win rate in non-transferred cases, 
in transferred cases, 28%. But in other words, transferring the case has tremendous impact on, um, uh, on well, the plaintiff's success. Plaintiff doesn't want to be transferred. So, um, lots of cases, very important. Okay, this is, this is the situation I'm talking about, that mainly students here, so uh, I wanna be pretty clear about what we're talking about. As Professor Dodson indicated, we've all signed um, forum selection clauses. I mean, if, if you've ever taken out a lease, you've signed a forum selection clause. But you've also signed a choice of law clause that uh, Professor Dodson referred to the situation of a, a situation where you have both a choice of law and a choice of forum. Very, very common. So it could be a lease, but in this situation, what I want to talk about is a, a consumer contract, foreign corporation, kind of forces a forum selection clause and a choice of law clause on the consumer. The consumer gets hurt. The consumer, naturally, American consumer, wants to sue at home, sues at home. The bad foreign corporation moves to dismiss. And the question I'm addressing, which is kind of uh, preceding everything that's been said so far is what law governs the question about whether the forum selection clause is enforceable and how do you interpret it? Um, now, by enforceability, I mean, it, these are fairly arbitrarily defined, but the, the definition I'm using, are, uh, enforceability includes contractual validity and also public policy about whether the court wants to enforce this kind of uh, contract. Uh, interpretation, what I'm talking about, is both legal rules of construction, but also the factual question of intent. Why is this important? Why is it not something that's been talked about so far? Um, this is the issue that any court, whether it's a state court or a federal court, will face when it's handling a case in which there's a forum selection clause. Um, they'll reach it before the Atlantic Marine problem. Um, the court has to say, okay, we got a forum selection clause. How do we determine whether or not this forum selection clause will have an impact, whether or not it's enforceable? How do we read it? Uh, so in any case, state or federal, this is gonna be faced. Why is it important? Well, because the laws on enforceability and interpretation of forum selection clauses really does vary uh, across this country, but also across the world. And so consequently, it really matters which law will apply. Um, also, uh, you know, why do we have these forum selection clauses? Because parties are trying to achieve certainty. They're trying to get certainty in their uh, uh, primary conduct. Uh, and you can't achieve certainty if you don't know what law is going to apply. You know, you make a select forum selection clause, well, it, also, it depends on whether or not we're going to look to the law uh, of for some foreign uh, court that won't recognize it, or we'll look to the home uh, law that would recognize it, or vice versa. So we really need to achieve the purpose of forum selection clauses. We need some certainty in the conflicts area. We haven't achieved that uh, certainty. This is a different question from the Erie question, um, either the Erie question that Professor Bratt was just talking about, the Erie question upon transfer, but also the Erie question originally, when the court tries to decide what law am I going to apply, uh, there may be an Erie aspect in that. It, will it be federal or state law, a vertical question of Erie law? on uh, this initial question of whether or not we have an enforceable uh, forum selection clause. So what do the cases say on this, what law applies? Well, you look at the treatises and they all say the law is split, 50-50. Um, split between applying the chosen law or applying the forum's law, the lex fori. Let me just back up a little bit on that. 
I mean, why is there a puzzlement here? You've got a forum selection clause, you've got a, a choice of law clause. Um, well, how are we going to decide about this forum selection clause? The forum could say, well, this is our view of enforceability of forum selection clauses. Alternatively, it can say, wait a minute, there was a choice of law here. We ought to follow the choice of law clause to a chosen law and ask what it thinks about forum selection clauses. So there's a chicken or egg problem. Do you look first at the forum selection clause to decide whether or not it's enforceable? Or do you look first at the choice of law clause follow the choice of law clause, and then ask whether the form selection clause is enforceable. Is that comprehensible, <laughs> uh, this chicken or egg problem? Uh, th that you, you, this is a ubiquitous problem, but you only see it, in this situa see it clearly in the situation where there is a form selection clause and a choice of law clause. Suddenly, it becomes apparent to courts, oh my god, oh, sometimes it become, becomes apparent, oh, you know, we got a real problem here, what law will apply? Okay, so the treatises say which law? Forum Lex Fori or chosen law. The treatises all say the cases are split. They're wrong, they're, they're palpably wrong because the mass of cases don't refer to the problem at all. They just reflexively apply their own law. Um, so that if you were to look at the mass of cases, the question settled, Lex Fori. The court will apply its own law to decide whether or not it's in for, uh, to enforce the forum selection clause. So the treatises are making what empiricists call a selection effect mistake. They're, they're ignoring all of the cases. They're looking at the cases that discuss the problem. And lo and behold, those cases split. Um, so treatise is wrong. But they're wrong on another level that the um, Cases that do discuss the problem, although some go for Lex Fori and some go for chosen law, they're, they're not the same cases. The cases on enforceability almost all look to Lex Fori. Is it enforceable? Well, we'll decide. We'll decide whether or not we want to let people run the show. Um, the cases that go for chosen law are going on for interpretation. How do we interpret it? Well, the parties chose the law of uh, the Bahamas, so we should look to the Bahamas law to figure out what the contract says. So that consequently, if you look more closely at the cases, there isn't the split that the treatises see. This is quite common, that, that um, people will look at a mass of cases and say, oh, they go both ways. You look more closely at the cases, and it turns out they're not the same cases. The, the enforceability and interpretation cases are quite different. Um, so I would just stop here and say, well, the law is settled here. You apply the lex fori on uh, enforceability. But the commentators unanimously look at the chosen law. This is Professor Yaki, who wrote a very good article. Uh, he's from the University of Wisconsin. Um, and uh, what he said was, you got to apply the chosen law, or otherwise there'll be no certainty. If you apply Lex Fori, then it all depends on where the plaintiff sued. Do you see that? That um, if, if you apply Lex Fori, what's the forum? That all depends on where the plaintiff chose to sue. If you apply the chosen law, all courts will look in the same direction. They will apply the same law, and so parties can achieve uh, certainty. More you look more closely at the problem, there are a bunch of policy arguments cutting both ways. The big ones are, up there on the upper right, is uh, Professor Yaki's argument that if we apply the chosen law, it will facilitate private ordering and increase certainty. Obviously, the big argument the other way is courts ought to be able to control their own venue, their own jurisdiction. Um, so, you know, okay, it seems like a toss-up. There are other arguments. What I think, I, I, what I'm, I'm trying to contribute here is this, this argument, these two big arguments between certainty and territorial, uh, uh, controlling territorial authority uh, really have to do with where to draw the line on enforceability. To what extent are you gonna let parties uh, run the show to what, sort of what Professor Dotson was talking about, the 
this morning. To what extent are you going to let parties run the show? To what extent are you going to have courts control their own jurisdiction and venue? Uh, where do we draw the line? I think that that's missing, that this is really a conflicts problem. That the real dispute is about who decides where to draw the line. And there, the forum seems to have an exclusive interest. It doesn't want to concede to another sovereign the drawing of the line on the uh, forum's own jurisdiction uh, and venue. And so that consequently, it strikes me that the, the conflicts problem becomes a much easier conflicts problem that the forum ought to control. It's, um, you know, a, 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 um, as uh, Professor Sachs said this morning, you, you know, should, should the, the forum say, well, we got to enforce this clause that makes our stomach turn. Why? Because some other court, other sovereign decided that they're going to enforce any forum selection clause. No, the, 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 the forum wants to control that question. So, in conclusion, just to sum up here, um, there, everything I've said so far deals with the enforceability question, that the forum ought to control the enforceability. If you look at the arguments, the various policy arguments, the general policy arguments, but also my trump card, they don't apply to interpretation. When the court has to decide how to read the clause, all the jurisdiction and venue concerns, what the content of those rules are, but also who, uh, who gets to decide them, they drop out. And so that consequently applying the chosen law on interpretation serves the interest uh, of both sovereigns and also gives a uniform uh, interpretation to the clause so that no matter where the action is brought, it'll be read the same way. So, distinguish enforceability from, uh, from interpretation. And when you look at the cases, that's what they're doing. They are distinguishing those. Um, well, what about the situation where there is no choice of law clause? I would decide it the same way. The choice of law clause is, um, the choice of forum clause is an implicit choice of law clause, clause on this that the uh, party's expectations about how, how the contract is to be read um, calls for applying the, cho the chosen court's law um, to interpretation. And so just to sum up, it comes out as a very simple approach that you apply the lex fori, the law of the forum, where the action is brought uh, on enforceability, but on interpretation, apply the chosen law if there is a choice of law clause or the law of the chosen court, if not. Thank you. All right, uh, I first, of course, want to join the uh, parade of folks who are thanking everyone who put this symposium together. Uh, Scott and Steve and uh, Rob and the other editors and Roz for helping out with the logistics. Uh, this has been just terrific, uh, a great topic uh, for symposium. And uh, of course, I also want to thank all the other uh, panelists and speakers. I mean, just speaking as sort of a, a consumer of what's been going on today, uh, I've learned a ton. Uh, it's been really great, and it's an honor to, to be up here, uh, up here with you all. Um, I'm going to be talking about Erie, um, and it might be a little strange to talk about Erie in a case that does not even mention Erie, um, and it might be especially strange to try to put together an argument that Atlantic Marine uh, supports a greater role for state law when Justice Alito said nothing about that and indeed repeatedly cited an earlier case, uh, Stewart versus Rico, that had essentially declared that state law plays no role in deciding whether to transfer uh, whether transfer of venues justified under Section 1404A. Um, so I first want to talk a bit about that, uh, some potential underlying tensions between the Atlantic Marine decision and the Stewart case. Um, and it's a bit like a, another famous Stewart, and, and I want to, at the risk of uh, identifying which generation uh, Rick thinks I'm in, uh, I'm thinking about Rod Stewart. Um, 
who on one hand can't ever leave Maggie Mae, but on the other hand wishes he had never seen her face. Um, <laughs> the Stuart majority told us, yeah, Kevin gets it, okay. Um, <laughs> the Stuart majority told us that uh, under 1404, a federal court could refuse to transfer a case even in the face of a valid form selection clause if it concludes that the party's contractual choice was outweighed by factors such as the convenience of the parties and witnesses. Atlantic Marine says, if the form selection clause is contractually valid, private interest factors like convenience are never sufficient to refuse enforcement. Um, so to quote Rod Stewart again, uh, the Stewart versus Rico decision's disrespect for state law might not stay forever young. Um, Atlantic Marine, in fact, has the potential to reinvigorate the role of Erie and state law in this context. Um, if enforcement in federal court depends on a form selection clause being contractually valid and contractual validity is governed by state law, then Atlantic Marine is a robust embrace of state law. The federal court's authority to second guess the state law answer to that question is very limited. Now, let's turn to Erie. So obviously much has happened uh, in the eight decades since the Supreme Court decided Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, um, but for all the layers of doctrinal complexity that have arisen, there remains a core of truth to the idea that Erie forbids a federal court from displacing substantive rights provided by state law. Arguably, and the argument was framed earlier, I think by Steve, right, for a federal court to override state contract law would be a classic interference with state law substantive rights in violation of Erie. Now, of course, this isn't the whole picture. Um, we know that federal courts can develop federal common law that overrides state law, even clearly substantive state law, if there is a uniquely federal interest. So one example of this was, uh, was a decision called Boyle, where the Supreme Court just developed a government contractor defense to state tort liability. But if Erie means anything, it means that the mere existence of federal court jurisdiction, standing alone, does not create the sort of federal interest that justifies displacing state substantive law. That is, that interest has to be more than just the federal court's view that a different standard for contract validity would be more desirable. And in fact, even if we concluded that there was the sort of federal interest that justifies federal common law, we would also have to consider whether that federal common law should itself incorporate state law. So the court has told us that the incorporation of state law into federal common law is appropriate unless a significant conflict exists between an identifiable federal policy or interest and the operation of state law, or if there is a need for a nationally uniform body of law. So there's a case called Semtec that was an example of this, where the court told us that when determining the preclusive effects of federal court judgments, federal common law should incorporate state preclusion law in diversity cases. And the quote from Justice Scalia is, since state rather than federal substantive law is at issue, there is no need for a uniform federal rule. Now, I'll be the first to admit there's a fair amount of gray area regarding what qualifies as truly substantive state law for purposes of Erie's core here. And uh, in the analogous context of the Rules Enabling Act's uh, substantive rights provision, uh, the Supreme Court in Shady Grove recently gave us a very fractured and inconclusive decision about how even to approach that question. But even if contractual validity of a forum selection clause is not truly substantive, uh, that would simply force us to consider what Hannah versus Plumer told us uh, 50 years ago were the twin aims of ear, right? Discouragement of forum shopping and an avoidance of inequitable administration of laws. We have a federal rule that allows plaintiffs to evade forum selection clauses that would be binding in state court or to allow defendants to compel the enforcement of forum selection clauses that would be invalid in state court that would seem to encourage precisely the kind of vertical form shopping that Erie is meant to discourage. One complicating factor in all this, of course, is the presence of a federal statute, right? Section 1404. And 1404 was deemed to be dispositive in Stewart, um, but I think the Stewart decision's treatment of that issue misses an important point, and it's a point that has come into uh, sharper focus more recently. Um, and that point is this, the Erie Doctrine 
may require federal courts to interpret federal positive law, whether we're talking about a federal statute or we're talking about a federal rule of civil procedure, to accommodate state law, provided the statute or rule is flexible or ambiguous enough to do so. So the good example of this is a case called Gasparini from 1996, uh, which involved federal rule of civil procedure 59, which governed a defendant's post-trial motion challenging a jury's damage award as excessive. What the court said was that because of Erie, federal courts were required to use the state law standard for evaluating those kinds of damage awards. So in Gasparini, it had to use New York's deviates materially standard rather than the traditional federal approach that allowed a new trial only when the damage award was so excessive as to shock the conscience. The logic was Rule 59 itself didn't impose the shock the conscience standard that had long applied in federal court. So there was room for the operation of a state law standard like New York's. And even more recently, in Shady Grove, although they disagreed on the ultimate outcome, all nine justices endorsed the view that for eerie purposes, federal rules should be construed, if possible, to vindicate Erie's twin aims. If you follow this logic in the venue transfer form selection clause context, 1404 is standard for transferring venue, right, for the convenience of the parties and witnesses and in the interest of justice, is flexible enough to allow federal courts to follow state law, right? If the interest of, interest of justice is served by holding parties to their bargain, then federal courts can follow state law on the question of whether, as a matter of contract, that bargain has been made. If that's true, then the key inquiry therefore becomes whether allowing a federal court to reach a different conclusion about contract validity is likely to encourage form shopping or lead to inequitable results. So the upshot of all this is contrary to what the court suggested in Stewart, 1404 does not automatically take the Erie issue out of this twin aims inquiry. We need to ask whether 1404 can be interpreted in a way that will accommodate state law if doing so uh, will vindicate Erie's twin aims. Um, and I'll also add that viewing 1404 as federalizing contract validity is somewhat in tension with Atlantic's Marine's, Atlantic Marine's statement that its approach applies with equal force when a forum selection clause picks a state forum or a foreign forum. Right, in that context, the court can't use 1404. It has to use the non-statutory device of a forum non-convenience motion Yet Alito says 1404 motions and form non-convenience motions have to be evaluated the same way, which suggests for eerie purposes that the presence of a federal statute in and of itself can't be what resolves this vertical choice of law question. Um, and it might also even be constitutionally problematic to read 1404 as authorizing federal courts to displace state contract law. Um, Cast your mind back, Justice Brandeis's reasoning in Erie contemplated some constitutional principle that constrained both Congress and the courts. I said Congress has no power to declare substantive rules of common law applicable in the state. Now it's never been clear what constitutional limit on congressional authority Justice Brandeis had in mind, and uh, some have kind of dismissed the whole notion as a relic of pre-New Deal thinking, but one possibility is simply this. Just as federal courts can't displace state substantive law simply because they have jurisdiction to adjudicate a particular case, Congress lacks authority to displace substantive state law solely on the basis that federal courts might have jurisdiction over cases concerning those substantive areas of law. Now, of course, even if you buy this, Congress still has lots of power, maybe dwindling, but power under the Commerce Clause. Um, this, this sort of legislative counterpart to Erie would simply uh, simply be the idea that Congress's power vis-a-vis -vis the federal judiciary standing alone does not justify displacing state substantive rights. Now I'll admit this is in some tension with what the court said uh, in Hanna about the, the scope of the power and the necessary and proper clause, but uh, we've also seen the necessary and proper clause be uh, uh, contracted uh, somewhat in recent years. So if we view Atlantic Marine through the lens of Erie, uh, this may also bring into focus the question of what are those unusual or extraordinary circumstances that Justice Alito alluded to that might justify refusing to enforce a contractually valid form selection clause. Well, if you buy the arguments I've been outlining, all of which 
I'm telling you anyway, are consistent with Atlantic Marine's own recognition that an inquiry into contractual validity precedes any consideration of whether a remedy is justified by a 1404 or forum nonconvenience, then a federal court's power to trump state law requires the presence of uniquely federal interests. And you can at least see a relationship between some of the public interest factors identified in Atlantic Marine and the sort of federal interest that might justify an override of state law in the context of a forum selection clause. So if, for example, one of the public interest factors is uh, court congestion, right? If especially severe court congestion was present in the selected federal district, there might be a unique federal interest in avoiding further burdens on that district. Um, and one can imagine a situation where whether it's congestion or whether it's, you know, Hurricane Katrina or something and a federal district is simply uh, unavailable, lacks the practical ability to adjudicate the case, maybe there's a unique federal interest in uh, avoiding undermining the, the very integrity of the federal judicial process. Now again, this doesn't mean that all form selection clauses are automatically enforceable. It just kicks the question to what state law would allow. So a lot of the arguments that you might look to and that uh, uh, Linda's probably going to raise about why form selection clauses are problematic, those may well be vindicated under state law. But if they're vindicated under state law, you don't necessarily need to worry about Justice Alito's restrictions on, uh, restriction on the 1404A inquiry to just those public interest factors. Okay, let me deal briefly with my remaining time about this, uh, with the original Stewart scenario, right? So, what happens if the result in state court would be a refusal to treat the forum selection clause as contractually valid? Atlantic Marine, as has been alluded to already, doesn't deal with this situation. And it's a little trickier because concluding that a contract does not require a transfer, right, because uh, the forum selection clause is invalid, does not necessarily forbid a transfer, right? So that is a forum selection clause is not the only reason why a court might transfer or dismiss a case in favor of another forum. So if we really want to tackle this question, we need to confront a broader one, which is, does Erie allow a federal court to dismiss or transfer a case when state law would forbid such a dismissal or transfer? And this question, of course, affects not just form selection clauses, but also state law and form nonconvenience, or even, even intra-state transfers, if the transfer is going from the Northern District of California to the Southern District of California. So I think many of the eerie arguments I've outlined here would apply with equal force to this question, right? Again, 1404A uh, is open-ended enough to be construed in a way that is consistent with state law, even if a federal court left to its own devices might apply that standard differently. We might still need to inquire, of course, whether in certain circumstances there might be a unique federal interest that justifies a different federal approach. Um, but if we take that view, we might end up with an approach that is, is nicely symmetrical, right? When it comes to forum selection clauses, or even forum selection issues more broadly, federal courts, at least in diversity cases, have to act like the state court a block away, unless extraordinary circumstances that create uniquely federal interests justify a different result. Now, the only possible exception I'll flag here is the more traditional 1404A transfer. Right, which even when granted requires the new federal district to use that law that would have applied in the old federal district. Certainly an argument that that sort of transfer might still be proper even if you buy everything I've said so far, even if a state court would refuse to grant a comparable transfer or FNC, a form of nonconvenience dismissal. Right, significantly, that substantive law does not change in that scenario which may make such a transfer less problematic under Erie's twin aims. All right, so uh, Rod Stewart said that he was as blind as a fool can be uh, in Maggie May, and uh, maybe my fixation with these sorts of Erie arguments is a similar form of uh, destructive codependence, but uh, if we take Erie seriously, uh, and if we think about how Atlantic Marine fits within the Erie framework, uh, I think we might find a more significant role for state law. All right, thanks.
Okay, go uh, good afternoon, and similar to everybody else, thank you to uh, Hastings and all the sponsors and people who put this together. And thank you to Rick Marcus for not calling attention to my age. <laughs> Don't do it now. Don't say anything, Rick. Uh, so here's what I have to say. Uh, I've been listening to um, my seven very, very distinguished civil procedure colleagues and uh, thinking, oh, you poor, poor students. Uh, this is what I've heard over the course of the afternoon. Uh, section 1404, Section 1406, Section Rule 12b3, Rule 12h, Rule 20, Rule 21, Rule 59, uh, 28 U.S.C. 1291 appeals, thank you, Stephen, the Rules Enabling Act, I'm sure you all know what that is. Uh, Van Dusen, Ferens, Laura Lines, The Bremen, Stewin versus Rico, Erie, Claxon v. Stenter, Gasparini, getting more exotic, and Lex Fori. So uh, they've been pretty much lost down at, there in the weeds. And so what I want to tell you is I'm not going to talk about civil procedure at all. <laughs> <laughs> You're all sitting out there listening to this thinking, where am I gonna get sushi for dinner? <laughs> all righty, and I'm also actually not going to talk about choice of law, all right? I think, I don't know what happened. They read my paper and didn't know where to put me, so they put me last, but I'm not gonna talk about choice of law either. So what am I gonna talk about? I wanna talk about policy, and I wanna talk about ideology. And I want you to think about this problem, not down there in the weeds, okay, I'm gonna kinda take a weed whacker here, and I want you to think about this problem from 30,000 feet above. So what does this have to do with? This has to do with the problem of form selection clauses, choice of law clauses, and their cousin, arbitration clauses. And these are pretty much incorporated into almost every contractual agreement that exists today. You all go, go online and you buy stuff online, right? And you, you're gamers and all that stuff. And you, you click through 20 screens and it gets down to the end and you click I agree, right? Okay, well there's a forum selection clause, choice of law clause, and arbitration clause and all of that stuff. By the way, um, in the uh, program that they gave you, I noticed that they listed my title as gaming the system but they left out the most important part of my title. So there's, a, there's that all important, after the gaming the system, the academic colon. <laughs> have you ever seen a law review article that doesn't have a colon? All right, so what comes after the colon is protecting consumers from unconscionable contractual forum selection and arbitration clauses. And my focus is on protecting consumers. All right and kind of uh, challenge, uh, channeling uh, Joan Rivers, I would ask you, we need to get real, okay? Let's get real in what we're talking about when we're talking about forum selection clauses. And the reality is, if you are a consumer, all right, you don't even know probably that you are signing one of these, okay? You certainly don't know what it means. You don't know what the effect of it is going to be. And then if some controversy or dispute arises, Okay, all of a sudden, you have to go litigate your suit in a place that was chosen in advance by the corporate defendant, which means you're going to lose. There's also, okay, even in the doctrine, there is some room uh, for raising a contract defense of unconscionability, and there are various formulations of this in the cases. I can tell you, having read a zillion forum selection clause cases, the person objecting to enforcement of the forum selection clause loses all the time, right? Loses all the time. And I've written a lot about this over and over and over again. And basically, I think at least in the um, consumer realm, these clauses are entirely unfair, unfair, and the doctrine leaves no room, all right, for consumers realistically to challenge in these. So where does Atlantic Marine fit? Where does Atlantic Marine fit in this? By the way, I begin my article by saying that the United States Supreme Court loves 
forum selection clauses. They, and they've decided at least four or five cases in which they have consistently upheld forum selection clauses. But I also want you to know that this was not always the doctrine. Up until the doctrine, uh, up until the case of the Bremen, the doctrine was absolutely the opposite, all right? And forum selection clauses um, were not honored. They were considered to be uh, to ousting a court of its jurisdiction, and they were considered to be against public policy. And then in the Bremen, the Supreme Court changed course. They absolutely reversed their doctrine, right? And they said that um, the doctrine of ouster of jurisdiction was no longer any good, um, and they really didn't talk very much about public policy. They just uh, articulated um, basically uh, a doctrine uh, that was supportive uh, of enforcement of forum selection clauses. The Bremen arose in the context of two sophisticated business parties on both sides uh, of the contractual doctrine dealing with each other, and so in that context, the Supreme Court said that there were valid reasons for wanting to enforce uh, the party's agreement. Um, and I don't have too much quarrel uh, with the enforcement of forum selection clauses in a business context where you have sophisticated business partners on both sides of the deal knowing and understanding what they're doing. Where I think the Supreme Court made a radical departure and the wrong turn in all of this was in the case of Carnival Cruise Line, where they extended this doctrine basically to consumer contracts. In that case, it was the enforcement of a forum selection clause in a passenger ticket uh, for Carnival Cruise Line. And in case you don't know, every single cruise line uh, basically ha in the passenger ticket has a forum selection clause forcing uh, litigants to litigate their cases in the cruise line's choice of forum, which is usually Miami. What happened in Atlantic Marine? Um, the court concluded that the appropriate procedural mechanism uh, basically, uh, when confronted with a 14, uh, when confronted with a forum selection clause, was a 1404A transfer. But in so doing, they further extended doctrine, and they said some really interesting things, which I think has made it even worse for consumers in these cases. Court went on to say that when you have a forum selection clause, a plaintiff's choice of forum merits no weight at all. Um, and if, as you will learn, okay, in law school, there has been a traditional doctrine of courts giving due deference to plaintiff's choice of forum. Well, that's completely out of the window when you have a forum selection clause. Also, um, as Professor Efren has pointed out to you earlier in the day, uh, the Supreme Court also basically eviscerated forum nonconvenience doctrine by saying when you have a forum uh, selection clause, courts should no longer consider the party's private interests. And then the third peg, uh, in addition, was the court said, uh, in contrast to Van Dusen and Ferens, when you have a 1404A transfer with a forum selection clause, uh, the court will not apply the transfer of court's cho uh, choice of law rules. In addition, when you read through the decision, and I discuss this at length in my paper, even though the court doesn't say it explicitly, the court comes very, very close to saying that forum selection clauses almost are presumptively valid. They leave very, very little room for challenging these clauses, and there's lots of language running around the decision. Um, basically, it is very difficult to overcome the clauses. So the Supreme Court says they can only be overcome in extraordinary circumstances or in unusual cases. This, by the way, was language from some of the earlier decisions, and I went back and I tracked earlier forum selection clause cases to find out where were these exceptional, extraordinary circumstances, where were these unusual cases, and you can't find one. You cannot find a single case where a court has invalidated a forum selection clause because they found extraordinary circumstances or that the cases were so unusual as to merit overcoming the forum selection clause. So what's the problem here? Um, the tack I chose was to say that basically there are two, it's a, a, a framing question. And the way in which the Supreme Court has come at this basically is to give primacy to contract law. Basically to give primacy to contract law and also in Atlantic Marine to characterize this as a venue problem. 
And what I want, and what I suggest basically is that perhaps there's another way of thinking about form selection clauses which might be useful, particularly in the consumer um, arena. And what I look to, and you will learn this in civil procedure, how many people here are one L's? So you have no idea what anybody's <laughs> talked about all afternoon. <laughs> you know nothing, it's like, all right. <laughs> Not a clue, you've all been very polite. <laughs> all righty. Um, so what will you, you will learn in civil procedure, this is very, very interesting. The federal courts and the Supreme Court um, has had a preoccupation with litigants gaming the system, hence the, uh, the title of my, uh, my article. And the federal courts have been especially sensitive when litigants on one side of the docket or the other come up with inventive gambits um, basically to gain forum advantage. And I give lots and lots of illustrations of this in my paper. And Erie is an interesting decision in itself. Okay, when you study Erie, you'll learn corporation went over state lines and reincorporated basically uh, to take advantage of a better choice of law. In decedents of states, there used to be old doctrine where people in advance of their death could appoint an administrator out of state in order, I always love this, after you're dead, okay, that you, if your estate was contested, you could have it in federal court based on diversity. Who has that foresight, by the way? But anyway, um, that was a problem. It was a way of manipulating jurisdiction, and Congress had to change the law, basically, to deal with this stupid problem. There's a collusive joinder statute, okay, which prohibits assignment of a contract, um, again, uh, for sham consideration, basically, uh, to get into, um, uh, into federal court, the case there is Kramer versus Caribbean Mills. I don't know if anybody teaches that anymore. I still do because it's an interesting case. There's all sorts of doctrines relating to artful pleading, fraudulent joinder, pleading damages below the amount in controversy. Uh, the Class Action Fairness Act, which was enacted in 2005, basically was Congress's uh, attempt to deal again with forum gamesmanship, forum manipulation. Uh, there's an interesting problem uh, dealing with gamesmanship uh, that deals with something called the forum defendant rule, which you also may, may or may not learn uh, in civil procedure. There's also, by the way, if you, if you go into Westlaw and you just um, search the, the term gamesmanship, you come up with all sorts of interesting cases where the courts have addressed this and say we don't want this. And so a lot of these behaviors are pre-filing behaviors by litigants, but there's also behaviors post-filing where courts again have come down and said you can't do this. Um, it violates our sense of fairness. And so what I want to suggest is that form selection clauses are just another way of gaming the system. And who's doing the gaming? Okay, <laughs> he's shaking his head yes. All right, the party doing the gaming here are the corporate defendants, okay? They love form selection clauses because it gives them control over the case. And it allows them in advance of a dispute arising basically to get their choice of forum. Um, again, and in the consumer, and in the consumer arena, this is particularly egregious because consumers typically don't have um, bargaining power. They don't have a way of negotiating. Um, uh, and in many instances, they're not even aware that there's a forum selection clause there. If you read Carnival Cruise Line, if you read the Bremen and then Carnival Cruise Line, the Supreme Court in both of those cases talk about why the Supreme Court is endorsing forum selection clauses and the purported purposes. And uh, Professor Claremont raised one of my favorites, which is the purpose of forum selection clauses, according to the Supreme Court, is to achieve certainty of the forum in advance of a dispute. Well, I want to suggest to you, forum selection clauses don't accomplish that at all. Okay, in almost every case where there's a forum selection clause, the disgruntled party is coming in and disputes it in court, right? They re we, there are hundreds and hundreds of cases, okay, dealing with contested forum selection clauses. If the purpose is to achieve certainty in the forum and to reduce litigation, these clauses are not doing that. In Carnival Cruise Line, incredibly, the Supreme Court said, um, we endorse forum selection clauses, it achieves certainty of the forum in advance of, of the litigation. By the way, that's only for the corporate defendant, the poor consumer is clueless. But the Supreme Court also incredibly said, we endorse these because there's an economic benefit, an economic pass along to the consumer, to the passenger. It's like, that's nuts. All righty. Um, 
So what's to be done? What's to be done? I can only say I think something needs to be done. I think this is um, very, very unfair. I think that um, having the conversation about whether or not in practicality and reality form selection clauses do serve uh, in a way to oust a court of its jurisdiction, but that's not the way the law is or the doctrine is framed, uh, deserves perhaps some resuscitation or further conversation. The, um, the old doctrine that form selection uh, clauses were contrary to public policy um, needs some jurisprudential space, and it doesn't have it um, currently uh, where um, the Bremen and the subsequent cases have left us. Um, I also suggest in my paper that none of this can be accomplished by a rule change. This is not a problem of rule change of the federal rules, uh, but that what might do it here is some sort of statutory enactment. And at the end of my paper, I suggest what that might look, uh, might look like. Finally, um, this, in the earlier panel, the question was raised, why did the court do what it did in Atlantic Marine? Okay, in this bewilderment about the fact that this was a unanimous decision. First of all, I want to point out to you that the case that I think where everything really went wrong, which was Carnival Cruise, that was a 7-2 decision. Um, and so the court has been pretty unanimous in upholding forum selection clauses. I think this is, not a, this, this is a question of ideology. And I think what we're looking at here is a Supreme Court that is basically pro-corporate. They have that bias. Corporations love forum selection clauses. So it's not a big surprise to me. What is a big surprise is, where were the court's liberals? Where were the court's liberals on this? Okay, were they sleeping? Okay, how could they have done this decision? And why did they keep enforcing or rendering decisions that basically give support for enforcement of consumer, of form selection clauses in the consumer arena? So those are my questions that I leave you with. See, I told you this was the better panel. <laughs> uh, I'm going to throw at my panelists an unfair question that just occurred to me as the program went on, and that's why I didn't ask them before, and I'm going to tell them what it is, and then it's uh, speak up time. Uh, but it tags on to the unfair question I asked the first panel from the floor, um, and it goes like this. Uh, first, however, I want to observe that Linda broke a cardinal law professor rule at such events by looking out at you students and talking to you about something that you might actually have found interesting. <laughs> and the rest of us deplore that break <laughs> with our credo. At any rate, <laughs> um, each of my panelists, in turn, going from the first to the last speaker, will have the opportunity to fulfill a law professor's dream of, the, of a lifetime and become the junior justice of the US Supreme Court. And the first case, well, actually, anybody here know what Justice Reed's first case was on the US Supreme Court? Erie. Uh, and there are some others that are kind of wowzers that came out. So yours is Atlantic Marine, and you're the junior justice on the US Supreme Court, and you know that all the eight more senior justices have agreed with the opinion that you've seen Justice Alito wrote. And the question now to you each in turn is, how do you vote? I suppose you could concur in the judgment and say this plaintiff shouldn't have pulled the trick it pulled and I agree with taking away the advantage it sought to get. You could dissent and in either event, how do you explain your vote, Andrew? Justice Bratt, you go first. See, I thought that one of the benefits of becoming a law professor was that you only asked the questions. After that, you You're back to, in class, You have to son. actually answer the... <laughs> I'll see you in the garage. Um, all right, uh, well, I can tell you what I would do. I would, 
I would have probably concurred in part and dissented in part, and I would have done two things. Uh, one, I would have pulled the Justice Thomas trick and said, you know, Carnival Cruise was wrongly decided and we shouldn't have decided that case that way anyway, and we should scrap this whole doctrine uh, when we get a chance. I also would have said what I suggested uh, was the right result here and said, well, maybe we would have enforced the forum selection clause, but we should look to state law to see uh, what, uh, whether or not the forum selection clause would be enforceable. And under circumstances where a state would not say the forum selection clause is valid, then I might say the transfer uh, to a new forum is acceptable, uh, but the change in choice of law rules uh, that a transfer to a new forum would take with it uh, would be wrong. So that's what I would do. Justice Claremont. I guess uh, my feeling would be that the enforceability of the clause wasn't really an issue there, that footnote five says we're uh, not going to decide the enforceability, we'll just assume it's enforceable, and so the only question then is how do we handle um, the enforcement, uh, how do we procedurally handle uh, forum selection clauses? Unlike most of the panelists this morning, I, I'm not so sure that the court made a big mistake. Uh, uh, I am going to dissent, nevertheless. But um, that is to say that we, we'd already gotten ourselves in a corner uh, with the f transfer, handling this as a transfer matter rather than 12b-6 or rather than a contract. And so I, I think that they, they were right to, to view this as a transfer matter. What I don't get is why they did 1404 and then have to do this oddity of applying tra uh, transferee law. Why not call it 1406? That if a court is going to enforce a uh, forum selection clause, it's a wrong venue. Hence, 1406 applies, we apply 1406, and as usual, transferee law applies. So I, dis uh, so I would dissent on the, on the remedy that was chosen here. Justice Steinman. Uh, well, I guess the, um, you know, the first thing I'd have to decide is whether to cite Rod Stewart or Potter Stewart. But um, uh, w once I sort that out, I guess I would say, uh, again, I think this is fairly consistent with what the other two justices have said, that uh, the opinion does, as, as I you know, hopefully uh, laid out, leave a role for state law. So one possibility would say, really, really look at footnote five. This is still an open question, and under Erie, state law can potentially deal with many of the unfairness uh, concerns that can come up in the context, especially of consumer form selection clauses, but perhaps others as well. Um, and, and I guess I just add, uh, in response to what Justice Bratt said, that um, uh, you know I think if you if you buy the role of state law as coming in as a matter of contract validity, um, you know I think you avoid the problem you identified, and you end up along the lines of that Southern District of New York case. The court could not enforce the form selection clause because it would be contractually invalid, and therefore the transfer of venue, if it occurs, would be under 1404, and you would be taking. Uh, taking the original uh, original law with with the, with the uh, with the case. Justice Mullenix. Well, this is easy. Uh, it would definitely be a dissent. I would indicate that uh, the Supreme Court should never have granted cert in the case. That the district court never made a ruling as to the validity or not of the underlying form selection clause. And in absence of having done that, the court shouldn't have taken the case. And what they've done in this decision is a classic self-inflicted wound that will not command uh, <laughs> the, uh, the confidence of the populace out there. And while I'm on the subject, I would write extensive dicta, <laughs> okay, <laughs> indicating why Carnival Cruise Line was a really bad decision and how the Supreme Court's extension of this doctrine into the consumer arena uh, has done a uh, tremendous injustice uh, in the realm of consumer protection. Did you want to dissent from the dissent, Justice Bratt? <laughs> No, I'm comfortable. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm comfortable that those of you who continue to pay attention, now those of us in the front of the room are used to paying attention to these things uh, no matter how long they last. Um, those of you who uh, were responding to, particularly those of you who were just responding to Scott's invitation that you spend your afternoon this way. I thank you very much for doing so. Uh, I hope beyond, besides, instead of, uh, 
an appreciation of all the ins and outs of all the things we talked about. <clears throat> you can take from this activity uh, a, an appreciation of the room for argument that exists in relation to something that might look, when you first look at it, pretty straightforward and simple. And it occurs to me that I am failing in my task of inviting questions from the floor. Since I had my own question that I got to ask, I'd be very pleased if I could see someone rising to, and I do, <coughs> <laughs> see someone, more than someone, rising perhaps to ask a question, perhaps for a different, Scott. Okay. Um. So I'm curious to those who spoke to the choice of law issue. Um, if, let's switch Atlantic Marine around, and let's say it was filed in a uh, permissive venue, um, and there was a transfer to an otherwise improper venue, but the forum selection clause was a permissive forum selection clause, okay? So ordinarily, you wouldn't be able to transfer the new venue, but now you can because the parties consented to this through a permissive form selection clause. My question is, what choice of law would apply? Would you, would, would you apply the transferee forum or the transferor forum? I'd apply Lex Fori. Um, <laughs> no, um, I, uh, I mean, I assume, I mean, I didn't understand your question, but, but this would be a transfer that is not compelled by the form selection clause. Is that right? It's, it, it's the first one, again, it was permissive, so you could have filed in the first district, you could have filed in the other one. I would assume that we just have, file in the second. But what about the venue laws? Was it okay in the first court? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, I mean, I, I assume that would be just the basic Van Dusen rule, uh, and the choice of law would come from the original form, but uh, I don't know. Right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree with that, too. <laughs> Uh, so this is a question mainly for Adam, but I guess anyone can answer it. I'm a little confused about what space you think remains for state law under uh, for forum selection clauses when you talk about determining their validity. I mean, do you think that this honestly means that there is some space for state courts to say, in general, that certain types of contracts do not have valid form selection clauses, or is this limited to a situation in which there's the, that sort of traditional litany of, uh, you know, fraud, overweening influence, etc., so that it's really more of a question of, well, this particular clause is invalid mainly just because perhaps this entire contract is invalid. I mean, what space is there for validity of forum selection clauses as opposed to just the validity of a particular contract? I think we have a tag team thing going on here, so. Yeah, uh, uh, David, are you along the same lines? Yeah, exactly. I wanted to just pile on at this point. Levine of California, I feel like it's an airline <laughs> meeting. Uh, first off, to address the students, Fear not, take Civ Pro 2 and this stuff will be clearer. Maybe not clear, <laughs> but clearer because we pretty much cover all of this. Adam, to you what I wanted to pile on was how can you take your position in light of the fact that Justice Scalia took that position in dissent in Stewart versus Rico and it was roundly ignored by Justice Marshall. So what makes you think there's any room for your position, if you would? Yeah, so uh, to take that one, one first, and I don't know if this is Nikolai Volkov and the Iron Sheik, or uh, you guys can Google that. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, um, I think, uh, as to, you know, why should this be any different than Stewart, I think that one answer is Gasparini. The court has been, uh, or the argument that we need to read something like 1404 to accommodate state, state law um, has gained more traction there in a way that wasn't, wasn't present back then. Um, as to Robin's question, I, I certainly think, I don't see any problem as a matter of Erie or as a matter of what's in the Atlantic Marine decision in saying if state law says certain kinds of form selection clauses are per se, you know, unconscionable, um, that that is the content of state contract law and that that can and should come in uh, as a matter of Erie and, again, through the window of footnote five, 
may come in through Atlantic Marine. Now, again, the court may disagree with me on that, and Justice uh, Mullenix may disagree with yeah, me. No, on no, that. I just want to ask you one of the odd wrinkles about Atlantic Marine was that the contract was at Fort Hood, mm -hmm. okay, which placed it under federal law, mm -hmm. but under the Texas Business and Commercial Code, that code said that those clauses were not enforceable. So had it not been subject, had it not been a contract involving uh, uh, construction at Fort Hood, under your theory, what would the outcome be? Yeah, I think the answer would be it's not valid. It's not contractually valid. And so and that frankly, the federal court would have had to first apply the Texas underlying Texas law correct. under Erie. Correct. That's, that's the basic Erie argument. Now, again, maybe that's what the liberals on the court were thinking. Would the case have gone up preserve, to the Supreme Court? Uh, if what, if it was just a run of the mill yeah. dismissal, basically yeah. refused to transfer because if it, if it didn't effort. occur, if, if this whole case did not occur at Fort Hood, mm -hmm. would this case have gone up to the Supreme Court? Uh, I have no idea, but I guess uh, certainly if the parties really teed up this eerie issue, I think it's one that's worthy of consideration by the Supreme Court, although I always hold my breath when I say things like that because I'm not always happy with the decisions they make. And part of that is why my approach to this issue and many others is to think carefully about these decisions in terms of where is the room going forward uh, to perhaps end up with places, in places, at least in the lower courts, that are, that are more, more, uh, more tolerable and more just from light of some of the policy concerns that, uh, that Professor Mullenix has raised. Can I just interject that the, the cases actually distinguish between the two kinds of provisions that uh, Robin referred to, that construction contract cases, especially franchise cases, where they, they, they don't, a lot of states don't allow choice of law in franchisee cases, the federal cases distinguish those, they apply state law in those situations, specific substantive state statutes, but on the overweening uh, uh, bargaining power and things like that, the federal courts tend to apply federal law. And so there's a big distinction drawn in the federal cases between general state contract law and this specific. But then the question is why should certain types of relationships be privileged such that forum selection clauses will not be enforced, but in the whole consumer arena, its consumers get screwed. If the state had a specific consumer statute, it would apply in federal court, I think, under the case, under the case law. But of course we know under Erie it doesn't matter whether it's in a statute or whether it's part no, of No, 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 a, a specific yeah, substantive uh, provision, right. statutory although, or common law. Right, although interestingly then, you know, even if state law were silent at the moment that the decision is in federal court, theoretically that just means the court has to make an eerie guess about right, what right. state law would be as if it were the first state court uh, to address it. So it seems the arguments are still, are still open there, at least that you are not bound by what the court said in Carnival Cruise lines which is an admiralty case. If it's a diversity case, there's more room for state law. Uh, <clears throat> the next question comes from Bill Dodge, but I have a couple of questions for him first. Um, <laughs> I have a vague recollection, Bill, that you clerked for Justice Blackman. Yes. And I have another recollection that he was the author of Carnival Cruise Lines. Yes. Go ahead with your question. <laughs> it was not my term. I take no responsibility. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I was really interested in the question you've actually just been discussing. I'm not sure I understood the range of answers I've just heard, though. And I was, I was really going to direct the question at Kevin and say, so your formulation, which is very clear and very simple, says, you know, on enforceability, apply the law of the forum. And I was simply going to ask you, is that federal law or state law? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, I was politely not making this point. The case law doesn't follow academic eerie theory. Uh, the case law, the federal case law is overwhelmingly, same thing if you look at it closely, overwhelmingly federal uh, law applies, except for when the state has a provision which is specifically substantive. That is, in other words, if the state is merely expressing a kind of procedural opinion about party autonomy versus jurisdiction and, and venue, um, the federal interest overwhelmed the state okay. interest. So the, the state has a specific substantive thing, such as construction or franchise cases are all over the place, then the state law will apply. So that makes absolutely no sense to me as a normative matter. Do you think that's right? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Despite that leading. All right. I'll sit down and let Rick take over. One we more can follow up. Later. I mean, is it possible to, uh, to argue that the lex fori of the federal court is eerie? 
Oh, sure, sure. Um, that's why you have to look at the, the case law. My uh, question is for Professors Bratt and Mullinex, who uh, th this question is offered in hopes that you will disagree more than I think that you have um, to date. One question as to the sort of hostility to consumer suits. Why, why is the court gone along in allowing so many restrictions on consumer suits? And I was wondering if one explanation for that, you know, other than sort of raw politics, might be Professor Bratt's explanation, which is, look, there are all kinds of consumer suits. Some of them are the shenanigans going on in Madison County, Illinois, and all these, you know, crazy things that we can't really police very well. So just like a, a medical malpractice uh, damage cap, let's say, in fact is extremely unjust to people who really do suffer more than, let's say, $500,000 in medical damages. But we do it because we can't identify the meritorious uh, plaintiffs, and so we just put in a general cap that hurts everybody, but at least gets at the really awful extreme cases that are you know, imagined to exist. I wonder whether in some way we could look at the restrictions on consumer choice uh, very much the same way. It's like, we can't police the choice of law very well. We can't police personal jurisdiction all that well. They're filing these cases in crazy you know, jurisdictions that are awarding them all kinds of money. The one thing we can do is enforce these form selection clauses. I don't know that that's actually a, justif a sort of normatively justifiable perspective, but I wonder whether that's part of the intuition for why obeying contracts is so super important, even when it's a consumer contract of adhesion in the back of your cell phone agreement that you would never actually read. I, I, don't, think, I don't think I disagree with that, and I'm not sure that we disagree uh, about, that, about that either. Um, I, I will say that one thing uh, I, that I would do now that I've, I've been given the opportunity to amend my uh, half-hearted uh, concurrent slash dissent uh, in Atlantic Marine was that I might uh, uh, try to replicate Justice Ginsburg's tactic in the uh, Lilly Ledbetter case, which is to say uh, explicitly, hey, Congress, uh, you might want to do something about this if you have some particular feelings about it. Because one thing that may be aligned with what you've said uh, is that you know we don't want to be in the business of policing each of these cases one by one. So a blanket rule here uh, is better than no rule at all, at least from the perspective of the lower courts. And uh, Congress, if you don't like that blanket rule, hey, you know, Tea Party and liberals, if this is something that you can get together on and say this may be a, an issue that you could find some common ground, this may be uh, a role for the legislature. Yeah, I think I'm not following what, what you're saying. Um, what you're suggesting is an alternative explanation for why the court is doing what it's doing with form selection clauses in the consumer arena. And your, your explanation is we don't have control over all these other things, so at least we can have some control by <coughs> enforcing sanctity of contracts. Well, I, I think make, the, the idea is, and this may or may not be true, but if there's a perception that consumer Suit, suits on behalf of consumers are getting away with murder in certain areas. This is a way of providing the all-important certainty um, that we would otherwise lack. Yeah, and even if it's an extremely rough justice you know, approach, it gets us somewhere. Something like that. Yeah, but what I'm hearing when you're talking about um, uh, basically blowback or dissatisfaction with certain types of consumer cases sounds to me like commentary from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which just fits in <laughs> You know, with what, with what I'm saying is that, to some extent, ideology and politics is driving what's going on here, which is this support over and over and over again from the court um, with regard to form selection clauses. Uh, I think this exchange proves that this conference is a great success. Um, and I hope that you will join me in thanking our panelists for helping to make it one. And I, I, I have one more pleasure and responsibility. Um, as you may have noticed at the beginning of the program, the sponsors were identified then, and one of them was the law firm of Kerr and Wagstaff. Um, the pleasure 
that I have now is to introduce our closing speaker who will offer some comments, Jim Wagstaff, who is probably going to begin making his way up for that purpose. <laughs> I want to I want to introduce him with a note of uh, envy. Uh, he's obviously the founder of a very successful firm. I was struck that more than once the U.S. District Court here has appointed him to deal with some of its most difficult tasks as with uh, lawyer discipline and the like. Beyond that, he is a regular teacher here who uh, unlike me, has actually been chosen by the graduating class as the speaker at graduation. Beyond that, I saw him, I think, this morning at 7.15 as he was heading to the gym for some basketball or something like that before heading off to work. So I would say beyond that, uh, I am both admiring and envious and delighted to be able to turn the podium over to him. Nice long, nice long afternoon. I'm a point guard, so let's let's uh, think about how we how we pass the ball. So you've sat here this afternoon, particularly you one else. So I want to say that while we're all procedural nerds, you've now joined the club of being procedural nerds. Uh, what an amazing breadth of observations, and insights, and ideas, like taking a drink from an open fire hydrant. Haven't you felt that way this afternoon? <laughs> so let me ask, a, as we close an epistemological question. My kids would say it's a meta question. Why an entire symposium on Atlantic Marine? Isn't it really just the Bremen and Carnival Cruise Lines redo? That is, that forum selection clauses are presumptively enforceable, and that's just the way it is? Why is it that when I end every semester of my class, when I hand out my little plastic card of the top 10 civil procedure cases, this semester, I'm adding Atlantic Marine. In my three-volume book on federal civil procedure for lawyers and judges, 89 paragraphs in the book have changed as a result of Atlantic Marine. It's because of what Judge Posner said, as quoted by the Supreme Court in Newman Green, and I quote, law is an instrument of governance rather than a hymn to intellectual beauty. Some considerations must be given to practicalities. So if you'll bear with me for just a moment, let me be a barroom singer a practicing lawyer. This is a real world issue. That is, J. Crew Management, which brought the lawsuit in Texas where the project took place, was going to face a forum selection clause that would require the litigation of the case 1,400 miles away from where the project took place, where its five principal employees presumably would have to testify if it went to trial, in which at the bottom end of the deal, the lawyer because they're going to walk into your office and they see that clause, they're going to say for a $159,000 dispute, that's what was a dispute, we're not going to go, we're going to settle for a lot less. It is without question, therefore, a capture the flag reality. We can talk law and theory and Supreme Courts, or we can talk about the reality of who controls that flag. There is no question in my mind, listening today and otherwise, that forum selection clauses burden the lower tiered party to the contract. That's what happens in real life. Boilerplate clauses get negotiated by those with power and authority. And it's not just consumer contracts. It's this kind of contract. They don't have time to negotiate the form selection clause or power because they're worried about the payment clauses. And so it's brought. So is there broad impact? You bet there's broad impact construction contracts, franchisee contracts, consumer contracts, employment contracts. How about including it in a bill of lading? That's been held enforceable. How about putting in a shrink wrap agreement? There are several cases that have hold that's enforceable. Uh, how about just putting a clause there that says, and by the way, stay in state court, you can't go to federal court. That's been held enforceable. So we've heard a lot of great questions raised here. I do want to remind you that you should never walk across a river because it has an average depth of four feet. There are lots of interesting questions that apparently you're going to get to in great detail in Civ Pro 2 with, with all of us. Is it permissive or is it mandatory? What if the chosen form is highly inconvenient? What law governs the interpretation or the validity of the contract?
Are such clauses unenforceable? Uh, do we apply the transfer law? What about multiple parties? Uh, these are the questions. So let me end by saying that my observation is that this is exactly the opposite of what we've heard today. This Supreme Court, I believe this is the law of intended consequence. I think the Supreme Court knew exactly what it was doing. Justice Alito, in particular, said something very simple. A contract is a contract. Now, you may, if you're of that view politically, think that that's just freedom of contract from the, from the 20s coming back. Uh, but they said, as they've been saying, an arbitration clause is enforceable. A consent to jurisdiction clause, even in a cruise line contract or ticket, is enforceable. Choice of law clauses are enforceable. Is this unusual if you're studying civil procedure? Celotex said we have too many cases. We're going to have summary judgment being liberalized. Uh, Twombly and Iqbal said we're going to start that gatekeeping at the pleading stage, even if it seems implausible, as decided by a judge. Our amazing troika, if you're taking civil procedure two or even one, of McIntyre and Fiore and Daimler, of course, is the U.S. Supreme Court saying that we're going to give the larger bargaining party the ability to, to control jurisdiction, to say nothing of concepcion and arbitration clauses, and to say nothing about class actions in Walmart. So the Supreme Court, and perhaps as a Scott's approach as well or not, is giving the party that has, that has dominance, it's giving it dominance if it was dominant in the contract. It's that simple. So it's like the person who took their car to the mechanic, and the mechanic told them, I can't fix your brakes. That's why I made your horn louder. <laughs> the Supreme Court has made the horn louder of form selection clauses. So we end with so many large and impressive points from impressive panels. Oliver Wendell Holmes famously said that no generalization is worth a damn, including this one. <laughs> You're going to learn it. You are learning it. It is that fascinating. You have great people you've heard today. And I want to give you all a round of applause and say, all of us all say thank you.